And thank you for joining the session. Today we're going we're with Senka Milutu, Milutinovic, Milutinovic. And we're going to talk about Reading Rhythms Club, exploring queer theory, pedagogy, and mental health. The Reading Rhythms Club was initiated in 2020 by Carla Arcos, Juliet Duet, Senka Milutinovic, Arimit Bhattacharya. Maybe I am pronouncing in a different way the, the last names, if, if Senka later can correct me. Julian Christian and Julia Wilhelm. In the Willem, the Kooning Art Academy in Rotterdam. As an experimental reading group that aim to open up texts as a space for encounters and collaborative experimentation. So the room is yours, Senka. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, only a part of the Reading Rhythms Club, Senka. Um, and I just want to maybe start the session saying that um, I'm a bit sick, so I, I ask for everyone's patience. Um, and I'm going to share my screen and start a um, little presentation about um, Reading Rhythms Club, what we do. And then afterwards, we can have all a reading session together. Yeah. So let's start. Just a little confirmation. Do you see my screen? Yes? Great. Nice. Um, so yeah, as Salo uh, said and uh, gave a bit of a preface, um, reading Rhythms Club is an experimental reading club, which started in Willem de Koning Academy um, when, uh, yeah, me and Julia Wilhelm and some of our friends, like, yeah, Carla Arcos, Arimit Patacharya, Julia Duet, and uh, Julian uh, Christian, uh, were while we were all students and uh, studying there. Um, and it was sort of a space. Uh, for students to explore uh, texts with different kind of urgencies um, and different kinds of, um, um, I would say, uh, topics. And some were more theoretical, some were more fictional. Uh, everyone in the reading club uh, also kind of contributed with uh, a text that they would want to, to read and digest together. And what uh, also made it um, quite special for us is that it wasn't a reading club where you would have to prepare beforehand, but you would just come with people and you would read with the sort of experimental reading method. So at times we would read, let's say, uh, slow read a text so we can all aid each other and help each other to digest the text and to understand it better, while other times uh, instead, we would choose maybe to all read at the same time uh, or to kind of synchronize and read in different voices um, to maybe question the text more uh, or yeah, something of that sort. Um, these are what you see on my screen now is a collection of some of the posters that uh, we had over the years um, and some of the texts that we've read. So, we have things from yeah, Donna Haraway and more theory related things to um, yeah, a collection of texts we read from Palestinian authors uh, while the Israeli apartheid week was uh, happening in uh, the Netherlands. Um, and this whole endeavor started off um, in an institutional space, uh, but then later branched out. Um, and uh, Oh, yeah, uh, this is just a, a photo of Yulia and me um, in our most uh, recent endeavor with Reading Rhythms Club, uh, where we were hosting uh, the opening of UPS, which is an exhibition happening in um, Bach, uh, the cultural institution Basis for Actual Kunst. Um, and uh, the exhibition is called Ultra Dependent Public School. 
and it is similar to this like one endeavor and trying to reimagine education and what public education could be um, and also understanding what is lacking now and, and how can we build upon that and offer more uh, and we were doing a reading session uh, there as um, part of that exhibition opening um, so right now reading rhythms club is more a kind of nomadic club where we always say that we kind of co you know conspire and co-host with uh, uh, guests and, and other people um, who might have a similar um, similar you know um, interests and topics that need to be digested collectively. Um, this photo, for instance, uh, provided to us by Michelle was from uh, a reading session at uh, Renee Turner's uh, garden. And uh, Renee is a uh, professor of Realm the Conning uh, Academy, and uh, she wrote this amazing text on, on slow and situated reading uh, that we all, in that method of slow reading, read in her garden. So when I say that now it's the nomadic reading club, it kind of really, um, yeah, migrates from you know, reading in, in people's gardens to reading in exhibition spaces to reading in all of these different uh, spaces that you might associate with reading an ac as an action uh, or might not. Um, yeah. At times, um, also, like when we were finishing uh, and graduating from being students of the Koning Academy, uh, we wanted to sort of commemorate that. Uh, and we made a zine uh, of all of the reading methods and, and excerpts of the text that we read. Um, and um, yeah, and then spread it around with all of the people that were uh, regularly showing up and uh, that were uh, a quintessential part uh, of the reading club. Um, so this aspect also of like creating knowledge and sharing knowledge together um, and being there together is is quite important for us, um, especially because um, it is also a reading club where we kind of try to um, embrace while reading a text, first not assuming knowledge, but also allowing uh, space for all of these hiccups that might arise, uh, all of these questions. So we kind of alight and, and start from a text, but uh, usually it ends up being more of a discussion and uh, a lot more focused on uh, on talking and sharing uh, than purely just reading and understanding. Uh, or rather, we see that talking and sharing as being a part of a reading. Um, so for instance, in, in some sessions, we have also done things like um, quilt, and then quilting was a part of understanding a text and reading a text. Um, and all of these actions that we do become part of a kind of experimental reading method um, yeah, that goes beyond the kind of traditional idea of reading. Um, yeah. So that's kind of maybe everything I want to say about Reading Worldlands Club as yeah, a club as an initiative. Um, and we can maybe, um, because this is an interactive session, move on and kind of hear the voices in um, the, the Zoom room, <laughs> the, the digital room. Um, and yeah, if you could share uh, your name, pronouns, and maybe if you would like to share a bit more on uh, yeah, your relationship to reading um, or perhaps um, to education. Are you a tutor, a student, a, I don't know, yeah. So would that be an idea? I know it's a bit difficult always in online sessions when, who could speak when, but um, yeah, I think we have ample time. Maybe I can I can start. So hello everyone. My name is Salo Salomon. My pronouns are him, his. 
um, my relationship to reading, well, hmm, something that I really, really have always in my mind is remembering my father telling me stories when I was a kid. So he, some of them he invented, others were like the commons, I don't know, the pigs, the tree pigs, or those kind of stories. But because of that, I, even now, I really enjoy short stories. So uh, when I go to a bookstore, I, the first thing that I go to see is like the short stories. I am not so much of long novels, even if I can read them. But I do prefer these short stories. And I remember um, a teacher that I used to have that he told us like, these novels win after many rounds, but the shorter stories, if there is something to win, they win with a knockout. So this idea of like having all these messages and myths and sharing and even the developing of characters and stories, that is something that I really enjoy about the short stories and I have written two that I want to to publish and I am doing the illustrations for them so that's me <laughs> and I pass the ball I throw it to the air and if someone wants to catch it because it is falling really 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 fast and if not you can pick it <laughs> also <laughs> I'm happy to go next. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, hi, I'm Melissa slash Jonathan. Both names are equally desired. Um, you can see my pronouns on the screen. Um, also, no preference for any particular set. Um, mm -hmm. um, yeah, my relationship to reading uh, is long and extensive. <laughs> I've been reading as long as I can remember or like be been read to before I could read um so I have very good memories about from reading um I've studied a bachelor in literature uh, at Utrecht University in the Netherlands uh, and I'm currently doing a master's um sort of on the crossroads of literature and like um broader topics like climate change and sort of thinking about the things related to this. Um, so Donna Haraway, for instance, is definitely, oh, my video died. Um, Donna Haraway is definitely a, a person I've heard of and uh, read a bit of. Um, so yeah, I'm very um, invested in reading and I love reading. Um, and in my personal time, I do really love um, queer books, like happy, joyful queer books or and or sci-fi and fantasy. Uh, one of my favorite authors is Becky Chambers. I don't know if anyone's heard of her. Um, yeah, that's a bit about me and my relationship to reading. Nice, thank you so much for sharing. Who would uh, like to go next? Then I went to the next slide. I can uh, share. I, I saw that Todd maybe wanted to share too. Yeah, please go ahead. Is your sound not working? No, we can okay. hear you. I was, I was talking to Todd, but I, I can share right now. My name is Nathan. Uh, pronouns he, him. Uh, for me, I, uh, let's see, uh, I like to think that I, I, I enjoy reading. Um, I don't know if this is an any indication of things, but I have glasses and maybe I, I attribute it to um, kind of reading a lot, like maybe poor light. Uh, I think of like when I was 12 years old during the spring break from school, I remember I just got up every morning at like 6 a.m. and just read all day. And that was kind of how I spent my time. Um, but I, I enjoy a variety of things. And 
I, I think in my life right now, reading is a way to kind of build community and stay in relationship. Um, so with friends who, uh, who are in my family too, um, who kind of live in different places, we kind of read a book together and we talk about it. Um, and so that's a nice way to stay in touch and build community. And I probably have four people right now that I'm reading books with. Um, and so it's something that I, I enjoy for learning and lots of different things. That's beautiful, Nathan. Thanks for sharing. Can you hear me now? This is Todd. Yes. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> I'm just experimenting with technology. I'm so terrible at it. Um, it was great hearing everybody's answers. Thank you so much for introducing yourselves. It's really fascinating to be in a room with, with readers. Um, my, my name is Todd, pronouns he, him. And my relationship to reading has been a pretty solitary pursuit. Um, you know, um, it actually has been kind of a savior for me as like a place of grief, um, when there's nobody around and when I don't really know what the hell is going to happen next in this deteriorating ecosystem, social sphere, I just turn to authors and commune with the spirits that they conjure up when I'm with them, when I'm with the authors, if I don't have a mentor or, and a, you know, someone to be guiding me through anything, I just turn to a book. So that's my relationship. Thank you for asking. Thank you for sharing, Todd. And I'm uh, glad that you also is like someone who experiences it usually as a solitary um, activity are, are here to experience it collectively as well. So thanks for that. Um, anyone else? I, I can speak. Um, I, uh, my relationship to reading was that I, in school I did well, but I was never a fast reader. And I don't think I ever finished any of the reading assignments in college. Um, and um, I also studied a lot of world language. So I learned to read in a second language bit by bit. And, and I went on to teach kindergarten through 12th grade English as a new language and, and other world languages. So I had um, an interesting thing about, I learned this topic speaks to me about living in situ um, because students who were taught say reading um, in their home country and then came to the US uh, where I am on Menominee land in Wisconsin, they um, could, produce the words and they didn't have the content or the context. So this is very interesting to me. And now as a grandmother, I read to my three-year-old granddaughter. And sometimes it's through technology on FaceTime or Zoom. And so now I'm learning all over again what reading can be uh, and also how to read to a very curious and um, underanged, uh, unput upon child who has not been um, manipulated to, uh, for her attention to be away from the magic that the worlds that I'm offering to open are. So I, I'm thanking you already and so grateful for this discussion. No, thank you for contributing to it. Thank you. Um, who do we have still? Um, I don't know, Salo, how does this work also with um, translation? Like you mentioned Flora is in the Spanish channel, but does that mean that she can... Um, so we get an introduction from you too, or? Uh... Uh, sí. Hola. Um, ¿Puedo compartir? ¿Se escucha? Se escucha. Maybe. Yeah. Oh, espérame un um, momentito, Flora. Bueno, ¿Qué te parece si tú hablas de una parte? Hi, my name is Flora. Oh. From um, 
Chile. <laughs> I not speak English. Entonces me van a estar traduciendo uh, por chat. Um, agradezco mucho estar aquí. Bueno, um, mis pronombres son femeninos y neutros. My pronouns are feminine and neutral. Pero tampoco me molesta si me hablan con un pronombre masculino. But it doesn't bother me. Vengo de una sociedad donde, o sea, de pronoun. un círculo de personas donde from a society, from a um, hemos estado cuestionándolos mucho del lenguaje y sobre todo el feminismo disidente. Where we have questioned a lot about the language and dissident feminism. Más o, no, desde antes que he estado eh, navegando por el feminismo, tanto de Since forma colectiva como individual. Y cuestionándome también like un montón de and cosas. And también explorando a nivel de, um, del relacionamiento, de mi sexualidad y de from eh, relationships buscar en realidad esa forma de observar el mundo de forma and to find the ways to profunda y eh, me ha hecho sentir muy rara. <laughs> Entonces desde ahí really que generé esa afinidad con lo queer. And um, from that point, me ha generado esa afinidad con y el género en sí, el género impuesto. Entonces hace mucho rato que he tenido esta, como esta... Um, como observación en mi vida y de una forma transformadora. So um, for many time I have already felt this different más, way of lectura, relationship la verdad, in my life. Ha sido eh, super cambiante porque and en un proceso, en un momento era desafiante porque no me gusta que me impongan cosas. It has been Entonces, eh, cuando me imponía a leer un libro en la escuela, me daba mucha pereza. And in school, like an example, Después, eso se fue transformando cuando empecé a read, cuestionarme más cosas y it. empecé a leer cosas que realmente a mí me gustaban. But when I grew up, Entonces, I esa ha sido mi relación, really de ir a buscar lo que realmente a mí me hace sentido. Y después... So me di cuenta también de que no solamente me gusta la teoría, really sino que en realidad like. soy un ser más práctico. Entonces he tenido y he acuerpado mucho lo que he leído, he, he aprendido a, y me I gusta like ir a buscar el conocimiento y like experimentarlo practice. desde mi esencia. Like Entonces ha sido ese mi, mi camino, that, mi uh, observar y estoy aquí porque me llamó mucho la atención que fuera desde lo queer porque también me siento un ser muy queer. Gracias. And I really, really feel myself as a queer being, so that's why I am also here. Thank you, Flora. <laughs> thank you so much, Flora, and also thank you, Salo, for translating and and bringing everything closer to us. I, I really appreciate the effort from both of you. There is a few more voices in the room. If you do feel like sharing, please do. Um, if not, that's also fine. It's not a must, but yeah, we will be reading um, soon. So might be, yeah. Nice to hear from you. I have an addition I'd like to add. Mm -hmm. My, my ancestors you. were not allowed to own land. Mm -hmm. uh, And so they uh, went to books and learning. And then there was a time when they had to hide the books. And so in my uh, lineage, knowledge, gathering, and um, thought has been really important, especially to, in our religion, um, we don't have to believe in source we have to behave in accordance with um, life, uh, the, the preciousness and the gift and honoring um, source. So I just noticed that that is in me in a way that I hadn't been invited to consider until 
recently, and there's stories in my family of my grandfather hiding, buying the encyclopedias in the 20s <laughs> from my grandmother um, yeah. because that was seen as frivolous. Yeah. You know, I mean, it wasn't, but, you know, it was a precious uh, choice. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that, Lisa. Also, like the historical aspect of it in your own family. It's, I really appreciate it. Um, if no one else feels like um, introductions, I think we can move on to introducing the, maybe one, one last thing before um, reading the work that we had in store. And that's that I thought that we could take maybe five, maybe 10 minutes um, to write down an early memory that we have of experiencing gender or experiencing, um, if you go back to like really those early days of really realizing, hey, wait, this is, gender is a thing that we're orienting ourselves around. Um, I always think to myself when when I was young, um, and you know, as we all were at one point, completely unaware of it, and you're just living in your own skin, um, and suddenly you're kind of, what do you say, confronted with the idea that this is actually a big thing for a lot of people as you grow up, as you head into puberty, and then it becomes an increasingly more dividing factor. So I thought it would be um, nice to just have a moment if you have something next to you, like uh, a pen and a paper, or if you just have your phone as a text message to just take a moment and write down what is the earliest memory of that that you can remember of just experiencing, oh wait, this is, this is supposed to be gender. So if it's all right, shall we take 10 minutes for that? Yeah, is that fine? I, I think that Alisa just arrived and mm -hmm. she's telling us that she, they can introduce herself. Please. Oh yeah, maybe maybe before we do that, please, Alisa, do 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 take a moment to uh, introduce yourself. Can you hear me? Yes, definitely. Okay. I'm feeling shy, um, and I joined a little bit late. So yeah, my name's Alyssa. I'm she, her. <laughs> And relationship for reading, reading, if I feel com comfortable reading, or what is reading? I miss everyone else's examples. Yeah, no worries. We were all sharing, like, from, like, you know, uh, how you, how, what reading means to you, whether it is something close to you or afar, or what it means uh, in the context of your family or the education you got so far, or, you know, it can go anywhere. So. Mm. I love reading. When I was little, I wanted to work in a library. Mm, yeah, I read a lot when I was young. And mm, I read less now, but I find my life is well balanced. So I still engage a lot, but I also active doing lots of things. Mm, yeah, I'm curious with your workshop, uh, the description talked about all the pieces connecting to reading. Cool. Thanks. Nice. Thank you for introducing yourself. Um, yeah, we. I had in mind kind of now. Um, I don't know whether you came in the moment to to see that part, but that we all take like maybe ten minutes, um, just for ourselves, um, where it's available uh, to write down and like the earliest memories you can, or like a memory that you can remember of just experiencing gender as a concept and being suddenly aware that it exists um, and that it's a thing that people value a lot in one way or another or think about a lot. Um, so yeah, let's maybe take uh, 10 minutes to write that down. Um, 
if that's fine with everyone. Yes. And I'll stop sharing my screen for that duration. Hello. Hello. Hey, Todd. Oh, you can hear me. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Yes. 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 Yeah. No worries.
How is it for everyone? Are you still writing or do you feel like it was enough time? Thank you for the check-in. I was really wanting a check-in too. But yeah, I was feeling the same way. I feel done. I don't feel like it got very much, but I'd love mm -hmm. to check in. Okay. Um, nice. Um, I wanted to ask also, does anyone feel like I can imagine some of this might be quite vulnerable or, or something you haven't shared with people, but does anyone feel like sharing? If not, perfectly fine. But uh, if someone feels like it, um, yeah. Please go ahead. I can also go ahead too, um, and maybe just uh, uh, start off. I feel like my relationship with gender is quite complex and has been informed by a lot of these, yeah, early memories essentially. Of like when I think like early early ones, I always think like okay, kindergarten, and then this aspect of like already there is being quite a clear boy girl division and like a lot of activities being done there um and then never really knowing how to place myself because um the boys there would kind of think like oh well you are kind of one of us and like we're you are allowed to play with us um but then not really understanding at that kind of ripe age of of, of what four or five six why that only applied to me but um not other people who were um assigned female at birth um yeah and I still kind of yeah of course have these kind of questions uh with me and I carry them wherever I go um but yeah so that's one of the earliest memories I can remember of uh yeah a kind of gendered experience yeah. I'll give a bit of space if anyone else feels like sharing. If not, again, perfectly fine. But yeah. I'm happy to share. Um I, I wrote something down, but as uh, you, Senka, were uh, speaking, I remembered something else that was actually predating the thing, um, but I'll mention both. Um, the thing I wrote down initially was that uh, I remember, I think when I was around seven or something, uh, I remember having had a dream uh, where I could be standing, um, and I'm AFAP, uh, assigned female at birth, so I well, I could do it, but you know, uh, it's complex, you know? Um, so, and I remember um, sort of understanding that that wasn't like a common thing probably to dream of for someone who was me, um, but also kind of like liking it and being like, oh, this is intriguing and kind of cool. Would be, wouldn't be bad to dream of that again um that kind of vibe um and later uh when i sort of um more consciously um came to understood my gen came to understand my gender like in my late teens um i remembered that memory again and um it felt very sort of soothing and affirming to have that memory to be like oh it's not just me here now it was sort of always there and now i can sort of see that more and give that a place um, and the thing I remembered when you were speaking um, was that uh, also in uh, kindergarten I uh, that there would also be a split of sort of the the boys um, sharpening sticks against like uh, stone window window sills um, that was the boy activity and the, the girls were doing or like you know as I understood their genders back then I obviously I don't know what they would be now, um, but um, we're doing something else. I think more social games or like in the um, sandbox, something like that. Uh, but I would join both groups and just kind of go in and out of both groups, um, which feels accurate because um, I identify as gender fluid. So yeah, that's 
the vibes. That was my memory. Thank you so much for sharing. Also, very nice to hear one that's, um, yeah, really affirming and positive. Um, I did this um, workshop with a colleague once. I mean, what we're doing now, kind of uh, in a slightly different way. And yeah, the large majority of memories were often quite difficult um, and quite, yeah, um, negative. Um, so it's also really nice to hear um, an affirming one as well. So thanks for that. Yeah. I'll jump in just Anyone to else? participate. And uh, is this good? I can jump in. Um, yeah, just um, yeah. I remember my family was okay with me not wearing, I, yeah, I'm female. Uh, and yeah, I was okay not wearing a shirt. Some, I, don't, I don't know what like what stage that ended but like yeah I remember being on a road trip and like had my shirt off and was enjoying the breeze or something and just remember yeah just thinking like that I wouldn't be able to do that when I was older uh I don't know if I was maybe six I have a younger brother who's three years younger so uh yeah I'm guessing it was four or five um and I just remember yeah seeing his penis and thinking it was a foreign strange object that was unnecessary add-on uh so yeah not necessarily like the socialized and gender part of it but just like remembering yeah different body parts and then the other memories i had were more of like puberty so later on less like young memories thanks thank you so much for sharing i'm I can share two. Okay, I, I will try to, to read it because I wrote it in Spanish. So when I was in a school in like kinder, in between kinder and the next stage, I had this experience, really crazy experience. Uh, one, a couple of male friends were all fussy because of something. I didn't und understood why exactly until one day finally I was asking them like what is what was happening and they they first asked me that if I had money like maybe one dollar so the next day I brought the dollar to the school uh, maybe we were around six seven and finally I knew what was going to happen a girl was going to show us something. I had a lot of emotion because of that. I was thinking like, what, what is she going to show us? And why are we going to, what, what is going to happen? So we, we made a plan. Like during the recess, we were going to go to an empty class and, and yeah, be together. So we took a lot of time and Finally, when the, the recess was about to end, we could enter to this classroom. And in that point, a friend of mine told me like, she was going to show us what she had in between her legs. And we're going to show her what we had between our legs. So we entered the class, we were all nervous. And both of the, the two sides, we just, showed what we had in between our legs and it was really confusing because I was thinking like what am I supposed to see or what is she supposed to see and in that moment a teacher entered and she was really scared because that was like a great crazy scenario to see and I didn't know even what was happening but my dad was really angry when I come back to to the house because I, I really didn't understand until many years later what was what was going on in that specific moment. Thanks so much for sharing, Sola. Um, also that aspect of, of being small and not understanding what this means in the consequence, like in the scope of these norms um, and expectations, not just relating to gender, but also heteronormativity and all these things. So thanks a lot. If anyone else feels like sharing, please do. 
I can share. It's a very quick one, really. Um, when I was like five or six, I, I put on my mom's lipstick and her shoes and walked around the house and she was so pissed. She was like, don't you ever do that. And she took the shoes off and she took the lipstick. She's like, never do this. I was like, whoa. And it's so vivid in my mind. I did it like two or three times and then I gave up. But it was really, <laughs> yeah, I remember that really clearly. Yeah, thank you for sharing, Todd. That's also like a very, yeah, yeah, one to sit with or like one that follows you. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? I, I would like to share um, earlier when I spoke, I talked about um, never getting far in books because I'm a slow reader by nature because I make a, a connection to other ideas. And um, I was just reflecting now that when I read to this three-year-old little girl, like I'm thinking about um, language again. So like the sense of belonging and culture as the set of rules and testing where the boundaries and the interfaces are. So the little girl I'm thinking of uh, is very outgoing and, and um, she'll run up to a kid on the playground and take the toy away, you know, as a two-year-old. And I'm sure she hears, don't, no, you shouldn't do that, you know. And I've sort of been like, look at the child's face. Do they like that? Or, But now the play, uh, is often um, because she's of course so centered on, you know, every character we talk about is named Alma. If I hold a toy, she names it her name. And, and um, she's got this strong connection to mommy. And so, the, so I noticed that she's saying, asking, is she a girl? So there's already this idea of sorting and belonging. And I think it's like, if we make it a noun, it's, is she of this? So it's like this box that she, her brain or you know sense of herself in the world is trying to sort. And so also when we play and I act out things, she chooses me to do all the naughty things, have the characters steal things. So if she likes to take a toy away from a child, she, in the fantasy, in the play, in the imaginal realm, she's trusted me with some days, it's okay for the animals to share the food for the little rat that, that is the one who is the you know, alter ego uh, who takes them, New York City rats. Uh, and she says, um, no, and sometimes she says, no, no food. So it's a real question I have with is how as the adult in her world, do I guide her into I'm thinking after what was shared, I'm thinking now, maybe the rat, maybe we're going to have a story where the rat keeps getting away with it. And there's no one coming in and saying no. I don't know. But of course, like I ask her, what happens next? And she says, you say. So, so I'm trying to invite her into creating the story, co-creating the story. But mostly she's looking to me to decide. It's... um. It's an honor and it's a huge responsibility because I love this kid. <laughs> Thanks for sharing, Lisa. Yeah, it's definitely like a big consideration because we're already so embedded with these quotes and norms and you never know what you subconsciously pass down somehow. Yeah, yeah can she be, can she belong? you know and as they say can she become in this world of yeah. her yeah yeah exactly exactly this wow. thank you all um if anyone else still wants to share please do and if not i'll share the the resources a resource that we'll be reading melissa i see you have your hand up yeah, I wanted to respond to Lisa um, or Lisa. I don't know how you prefer. 
um, it reminds me a bit of um, the sort of uh, psychology, I guess, of uh, like when a, a small child is hurt and they look at like their caregiver to sort of check, oh, how hurt am I? Like, how how bad is this? Um, which I think is uh, like this, uh, a, a child needing that reflection to, in order to like place it on their own spectrum to be like, oh, is this, is this bad? Oh, this is bad. Oh, this should not. Or um, so it reminds me a bit of that of like, oh, should I? What could could I? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you, Melissa. It's like the mirror neurons literally in the brain, right? We're mirroring each other. And at, at one time, that was a body of water to look in rather than a glass mirror. You know, this is old in us. Yeah. So true. Thank you both. I'll um, share my screen again. And yeah, um, essentially the, um, is it full screen now? Yes, okay. Um, we'll be reading an excerpt. We'll see how far we get. Um, but this is um, a book that has meant quite a lot to me, although I still haven't finished all of it. Um, uh, the book Teaching Queer, written by uh, Stacy Byte. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the last name right. Um, so please, any native English speakers, if, if you know better, please do correct me. Um, yeah, and um, they are an educator, a poet, um, and um, yeah, um, a, a person who has extensively written on um, writing and gender and like all of these different genres and forms. So from writing a poem about it to writing um, a book about queer pedagogy and um, how um, that could be implemented in education. But now from a point of just thinking, oh, if it's queer pedagogy, somehow it means that we should be reading queer authors and just listening to queer voices, but also um, the aspect of um, writing and teaching being a queer endeavor in and of themselves. So kind of seeing queer as a verb and as something that is being done rather than a solid state. Um, and um, yeah, I digested a bit of this work. Um, as I mentioned a tiny bit before, in a session with uh, students from the Cultural Diversity Minor of the Villain de Koning Academy with uh, a dear friend and uh, yeah, a tutor and professor of uh, theory, uh, Tana Boston Mama. Um, yeah, so just wanted to put in the context like where, um, yeah, this kind of all started. Um, yeah, and um, the work itself, I will share with you now a link. I have it here, but I'm just gonna instead drop it in the chat um, because I can share screen, of course. And um, if you prefer that, I'll do so. But I can also imagine that my Wi-Fi at times not uh, might not be the strongest of ones. Uh, so that if you want, you can also just open the PDF. Um, following the link um, and it's uh, there it's yeah on my google drive and yeah ordered chronologically um, and I thought for how we will read this text that we can um, just simply kind of take turns almost you know like someone reads a paragraph and then, or less than a paragraph, as much as you kind of feel comfortable with, and then you kind of give the torch to someone else who takes it and then continues reading. And that in this time, um, we can also just have this space for comments, interruptions, interpretations, and dialogue. So that if anyone also stumbles upon something, 
that is not super clear or that they simply just want to share a thought on, we can do that uh, and that there's space for that. Does that sound okay? Um, can I can I suggest something be before we start? Please do. Maybe if we can go to the bathroom or drink some water, mm. bring some food. Definitely. Do we do like a five minute, everyone goes, gets water, tea, toilet That break. would be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's do that. Thank you, Sala. Thank you. I have another question um, about this um, activity. If we want to pass the torch to someone whose language, whose first language is in English, um, mm -hmm. is, is that going to be okay for everybody? Because <laughs> I might do that and I want to include everybody. But I don't know if the translators will want to know how that will work, <laughs> if, if people are comfortable or not. Yeah. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> I guess I only know that Flora here is uh, um, following the, the translation. So oh. I guess the question, I don't know who else is. So maybe question direct to the Flora, how do you feel? Do you want to participate in reading or not? Or What? Uh -huh. As said, I um, chat. Yeah. Un momentito. Yeah. <laughs> it's also all right if the We'll see you in a second then.
Are we all back? Do we need a minute more or? I think we should start and yeah. then whoever's not with us can catch up. Thank you. Thank you for that, Alyssa. Okay. Um, do you all prefer that I still share a screen or does everyone have the text open on theirs? And is there a preference? We have a preference. I have the PDF open on my end. Okay. Then, yeah, maybe, yeah, we just do that. Um, for everyone just entering, we're going to be reading uh, a, an excerpt now uh, from um, the book Teaching Queer by Stacey White. And uh, yeah, I dropped in uh, the link a bit before, so I'll do it again for anyone who might need it now. And we'll all take um, turns yeah, reading a bit and then, yeah, stopping and another person takes over and continues reading. And there's enough time for any questions, interruptions, and so, and um, we'll see how far we get. Oh. My mistake. Let me share with everyone. Yeah. Okay. And whoever has a dog barking in the background, I would suggest muting um, just because it's a bit distracting and then just unmuting when you speak. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So um, I can start if need be and then uh, pass it on to the next person. Yeah, we start from page seven in the introduction. Um, queer methodologies. To consider questions about querying composition, I needed to consider myself as a writer first. I needed to sit, consider how I would go about representing the material I gather, the students I teach, the questions I want to ask, to, in considering these questions of representation and methodology, I became invested in writing that enacts its central inquiries formally. And I turned to scholars in queer theory to think about methodology. Teaching queer subjects of inquiry and its form are informed by my own understanding of what constitutes queer. Jack Halberstam, in the introduction to female masculinity writes that a queer methodology is a scavenger methodology that uses different methods to collect and produce information. Halberstam argues, queer methodology attempts to combine methods that are often cast as being at odds with each other and refuses the academic compulsion towards disciplinary coherence. I love that part of disciplinary, like refusing disciplinary coherence. I feel like often in education we're forced into a kind of coherence without giving enough room for doubt and um, friction sort of. Um, and now I pass uh, the torch who wants to continue reading. I take to heart Halberstam's call for a scavenger methodology. And in this book, I try to push on notions of disciplinary, bodily, pedag pedagogical, writerly, and scholarly coherence. I do not think scholarship and teaching can pretend to separate itself from the teachers and the students who are its subjects. I cannot convince myself and have no wish to convince readers that there is some objective distance between the stories of the lives of teachers and the narratives of their teaching. And because I believe, as Halberson does, that methods are often cast as being at odds with each other, can be put in dynamic, productive combination. I try to compose as I try to compose as the scavenger. I collect my work and my students' work alongside one another. I try to move towards the layers of understanding that might emerge. 
I blur the lines of authorship. I make use of literature, science, personal narrative, and individual experience. I recall my own education. I describe the fragments and fissures of my own life alongside ruminations on the loon, my martial arts practice, the body, dolphins, comets, and my third grade teacher all become narrative threads with and against which my students and I can be read and interpreted. In this sense, this project is about writing, and this project is writing, teaching writing queer and writing queer, or at least as queer as it is possible to teach and write. Mm. Passing the baton to whoever wants it. Um, I, I, I would like to say something about this last part. Yeah, please um, do. In this morning, we had a really beautiful meditation with Sara. Sara is a, a mother. She lives in Egypt. And it was so beautiful because she told us, like, imagine a feeling maybe without imagining it, like sadness, maybe use a color, or even how courageous can be a horse, or how um a dolphin or anything that you want so finding these meanings in a different way it was like opening many ideas that i didn't have before like i, I was imagining how i can be courageous but i didn't imagine how courageous could look apart from the human experience but connected with life so how do we picture or how do we see different things but with nature too it's something that I, I just started to experience that I wanted to share with you thank you so much um well I can uh, I can also continue reading <laughs> if you would like yeah in Gary a. Olson and Lynn Worshman Gathering of Writers, Voices in Critical Intellectuals on Writing, Judith Butler responds to a question about her statement that difficult language can change a tough world. Butler writes, I believe it is important that intellectuals with a sense of social responsibility be able to shift registers and to work at various levels to communicate what they are communicating in various ways Olson and Wurzman in many ways this book communicates communicates in various ways in several registers and in multiplying forms because I believe as Bersha Ashanti Young puts it Really, theoretical discussion cannot be put to better use, I think, than for someone to wrap his life in it and disclose just how closely or loosely the cover fits, just how much warmth the blanket provides or how much cold it is still lets in. I, and I pass the torch. I'm happy to take it up. Um, instead of a science project, I wrote what I called a science book entitled The Monarch. And I remember drawing pictures of my family, giving them butterflies as faces. Alongside my father and mother, my siblings and their butterfly heads, I composed narratives that made use of all the science projects I could see in the room. I remember writing down the names of planets, which I used as the names for the characters with the butterfly hats, who were also my family. I remember there were, were volcanoes, and I remember trying to describe the anatomy of a fly, something Joey Lafarco, who had to repeat third grade twice and whom I loved for his irreverence, was working on in the back row. This is the first time I remember writing queerly and having a teacher who celebrated that sensibility in me. Johnny Hart 
a student in one of the first year writing courses I examined in this project writes in his midterm course evaluation form. It's like I keep going to write something down, but I feel lost. I feel like there's not much I can say for sure in this class. So I guess my biggest question is, how do I write if I can't say anything for sure about anything? In high school, I was supposed to pretend to be sure when I wasn't in my writing and lots of other things come to think of it. But now, now being sure is a sign of weakness when, it, when before it was a sign of strength. My thinking feels all watery. That's kind of cool that it connects to the theme of the conference. It's hard to fight the urge to freeze it back up. I'll uh, pass the baton there. I'll read. It is easy to note Johnny Hart's narrative gift of metaphor, how he is able to imagine his way through the literal circumstances of his experience with the readings and with the course. I am interested in his sense of liquid, of his thinking being watery. I am interested in that water as a kind of alternative epistemology, a way of thinking and writing. I am curious about how I might more explicitly encourage student work that functions as liquid, as fluid. For me, this means I must contend with fluidity in terms of reading, writing, thinking, and interpretation. As all of these kinds of literary practices overlap and move into another when students engage the practice of writing or when anyone does. One of the things I notice again and again about the work of queer theorists and really the work of many writers I love is the fierceness with which they are willing to interrogate the self, identity, and language. We need not reach very far into the pockets of queer studies to find this interrogation. Foucault's interrogation of discourse and the repressive hypothesis in volume one of the history of sexuality, Butler's interrogation of the category of woman in gender trouble, or Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick's interrogation of coming out in epistemology of the closet. And I will pass the torch. I think I'm just gonna interject here, not necessarily immediately to write, but to kind of ask everyone, did you in your education ever have like, you know, a teacher, a role model, or, or someone who encouraged like these queer methodologies or what, um, Stacy here writes of like someone encouraging a kind of queer writing, like taking all your family and describing them as butterfly monarchs and all these. Like, have you had a, a, such a moment? Because I'm always struggling to recall um, those moments. I feel like I've had them, but I'm also having trouble locating a specific person but definitely i've more abstractly i've had teachers especially in university that felt mm -hmm. open and accepting and um their classes felt like a safe space so like mm -hmm. at definitely at an abstract level and i feel like also at a concrete level but i can't remember um mm -hmm. which may be due to mental illness uh interfering with memory but yeah Thank you for sharing. Um, I think maybe I'll pick up. Oh, or Alice. How do you, do? You, how do you pronounce your name, Alyssa or Alyssa? Oh. Feedback connection. Just. One. 
Is this my connection or is it traffic for everyone? Yeah, for me, the question, I guess, yeah, from personally wrestling less with questions like, have I? It's cutting out for me too. Yeah. Oh. E3. Yeah. I think sometimes if you're. Can you hear me is, now? Yeah. Okay. It's yes. Better without the camera. I think it probably makes it more laggy. Okay. okay. Um, uh, yeah. Just, yeah. For me, the question is less about if I had in my past and more of like, how can I provide that for myself now and provide that for other people? Uh, so, but I also feel like I've had a really supportive um, background. So I feel like, yes, but that's not helpful to like specifics. Yeah. Thanks. No, I think it's all helpful to share that doesn't have to be ultra specific so yeah thank you i have a right go ahead i have i have a thought to share too please do um for me i think of my mother she taught at the school i uh went to or attended from like first grade through eighth grade and uh i remember a story how she would tell the story is that uh i would uh my 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 teachers uh who she knew she worked with they would wonder like, is Nathan, how's he doing? He, he seems to have trouble in different ways or he's not, he might not be kind of, uh, I'm just not sure how to track his progress because they want to kind of track it somehow. And uh, I think my mom, for one example, I think she said, I think it might've been with speech kind of stuff when I was especially little. And she said, they're like, oh, Nathan's not speaking much. And they're like, she's like, oh, offer him a cookie and ask him to sing uh, from the musical Cats. And, and I just, I, and I guess they were like, okay, he's, he's doing fine. Um, and another example was with reading, it might've been in uh, third grade uh, and they weren't sure where I was at. And my mom told the teacher, she, she said that uh, Nathan's not interested in, in the kind of the silly books you read in your class. Uh, and he likes his other things. And so um, I guess they kind of shifted gears and then it was kind of off to the races, but but yeah, so I, I had the support of my mother who uh, worked with my teachers. And so I was able to have those conversations and offer that support. Thank you so much for sharing. Well, um, I think it's also like such a, yeah, probably also a different a facet as well if it's a family member and then, yeah, has an even more, yeah zoomed in and, and better understanding of yeah how someone learns um yeah um i was also following a bit of the chat as well um and i think it would be quite nice uh, also if yeah anyone feels like uh who's yeah not not following in, in english but feels like reading in spanish um or like if I understood this, uh, or if we want to listen in Spanish, how this text sounds from uh, Camila, right, translating. Um, I think that's also like kind of, a, yeah, quite a different approach. And we have, uh, oh, or no? Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm now just uh, vocally replying. I don't know, understand. Yeah. Allow me just a moment. Um, Flora, mm, tal vez si es que te gustaría leer la traducción. Let me tell you. Si te gustaría leer la traducción que consiguió Camilo, entonces tú lo lees y nosotros escuchamos en español para que podamos como sentir el texto desde otra forma. Entonces la propuesta es, nosotros lo leemos en inglés, pero tú lo narras en voz alta en español. ¿Qué te parece? Eh, ¿Quieren que yo lea en español? Ajá, una parte en español? Sí, es yeah. como un experimento. Ajá. Ok. Um, espérenme un poquitito. 
Y a ver. Um, yo voy, ¿dónde van ustedes? Yo voy a la 19 porque no alcancé a estar con ustedes. Estamos Ay, no, no sé en la página, estamos. Porque tuve que dice, descargar el texto y uh -huh. traducir. Donde dice 10 introducción. Ustedes van muy ma, más allá, pues. Estamos en la sección 10. Porque eh, comienza en la sección 7, después hay una sección 8. No, te, no escucho al salo. Cami, está escuchas? escribiendo, no escucho al salo. No, no, Salito, no te escucho. ¿No me escuchas? Ok. Tal vez si me pasas a mí, Cami, yo lo puedo leer. Ya, ahora sí estoy. Ahora sí te okay. escucho. Bien. Entonces, um, estamos en la sección, pasamos la 7, que es la primera, la 8, que está en dos partes, la 9 y ahorita estamos en la 10, al inicio de la 10. No entiendo tus indicaciones. Um, a ver. No sé si será porque mi, mi, mi traducción está diferente. Si me compartes pantalla para poderte guiar en qué parte estamos. Ok, a ver. Ahí puedes compartir pantalla. Ok. Mm, aquí está. Ok. Entonces... ¿En qué parte están? Yo estaba un poquito, yo estaba por aquí leyendo, pero... She's trying to find in which part are, do we are. Can, can you help us maybe here, Senka? Mm. Uh, go, go with, ¿Puedes moment. ir un poquito más lentito? Sí, perdón. Estamos, ¿Puedes ir un poco más arriba? Un poco más arriba. Ahí. 18 introducción. 18 introduction. I, I don't know where is 18. Okay. Oh, so you're one. Tienes que ir uno más atrás. Porque está la 18, la 11 y la 10. Ajá. ¿Ahí? Más arriba, más arriba. Ahí. Un poquito más arriba. Ahí. Esa parte, el yeah. interrogatorio. Exactly. Yes. Desde el punto que dice yeah. Sedwick, escribe. Ya, yeah, ok. Gracias. El, interroga el interrogatorio de Sedwick sobre la salida del armario. En epistemología, a epistemolog I of the Glosset, Sedwick es escribe. Pero, de nuevo, el alcance, la construcción, el significado y especialmente la historia de cualquier continuidad teórica por no mencionar sus consecuencias para la política práctica, deben estar abiertos a cualquier interrogación. De hecho, incluso pensar en el movimiento de Butler, de imaginar el drag como una especie de ensayo potencialmente subversivo del género, es también una forma de imaginar los cursos que imparto como un ensayo potencialmente subversivo de la enseñanza queer. Una especie de experimento inductivo de pedagogía queer, no es pedagogía liberadora, ni pedagogía crítica o feminista, sino algo más. O, o como, y como Sedwick afirma, además, la investigación antihomófoba homófoba, <ríe> no es coextensiva con la investigación feminista, pero no podemos saber de antemano en qué se diferenciarán. Lo mismo puede decirse la investigación de la pedagogía queer y de otros tipos de investigación pedagógica. Imparto cursos de escritura con la interrogación en mente, interrogación que inevitablemente implicaría interrogaciones sobre el lenguaje, la identidad y el yo. Intento comentar, comenzar mis cursos con un interrogatorio sobre lo que quizá sea una de las comulga, comul, cu, culminaciones más sagradas del lenguaje, la identidad y el yo. El género, después de todo, el masculino femenino, funciona como un binarismo primario y quizás modélico que afecta la estructura y el significado de muchos, muchos otros binarismos. Sedwick, Epistemología 84. Eso. Gracias. Gracias a ustedes.
<laughs> Está bien. Thank you so much. That was Thank an you. amazing, uh, yeah, experiment. <laughs> yeah, and also lovely to hear the cat as well. <laughs> cool. That's a good strategy. Yeah, I can continue. How categorizations, quote unquote, work is a question of theoretical function and construction as opposed to what categorizes, quote unquote, me, which would suggest first that we could even know what they mean, and second, that they, that they have inherent or fixed meaning. While queer pedagogy would not be the first radical pedagogy to aim to disrupt, disrupt binarisms, it does seem that a queer pedagogy might ask that students and teachers disrupt binaries in some very specific, embodied, sexed, and gendered ways. Ways that cut right to the heart of who we think we are or who we think others are. These categories, of course, have something to do with gender and bodies, kinds of people. And they also have everything to do with form, kinds of writing. And now is a next kind of subchapter, body of knowledge. Um, yeah, I'm giving the baton to whoever wants to continue. The phrase body of knowledge is most familiar to us as institutional, a set of sanctioned practices. This body of knowledge is understood to be located outside the self. It is something we can grasp towards, something we can know, something we can teach, but it is not, however, something that we are. In this model, I have the body of knowledge. My students do not. However, even if I have this even as I have this body, this, this does not mean I am this body or can ever be it. Our bodies are forbidden to be this body of culture, body of knowledge. Our bodies are meant to be outside, separate from the body of knowledge. What we know then is not supposed to be at all about embodiment. The body of knowledge replaces the body, substitutes institutional sanctions in its place, intending to forever codify and compartmentalize what we know from what we do, from what we are from the lived experience of our bodies. The political stakes of this body of knowledge are then quite high. It even paves the way for us to dismiss or disregard what the body knows in favor of what the institution knows. Passing the baton. I love this part, like in the beginning, how, um, yeah. <laughs> It was fun last time when I was reading it with, sorry, my my uh, cat has something to say as well. Um, <laughs> but, um, I love how essentially in this time, like, I don't know, when I was studying here in, in Vardam, embodied knowledge already was a thing that was mentioned in the education and what it means, what kind of knowledges we already have that's stored in the body that's not um, you know, often regarded or that's not carried out in an artistic practice, but it could be. Um, whereas, yeah, Stacy describes kind of the, the complete opposite of that, where a body of knowledge is just the sources that you provide, the references that you give, the books, um, what the institution considers, but not your own personal experience, anyhow. Um, yeah. And I can imagine we all come from um, different educational spheres. Um, so I don't know how it was for, for all of you. Um, for me in my like late bachelor's and master's, there's been more sort of encouragement of like my own personal experiences, but like the system that I can share it within is still very much a system that doesn't really know how to work with that yet. So 
Like for instance, I still would have to write essays and I'd still have to have a certain kind of structure and sources, but I could also kind of include myself as a source, but not the sole source. So it's, yeah, th there's the weird sort of transition from systems I'm hoping um, present there. Um, but I also wanted to share that it's, um, a very beautiful coincidence that um, the author that I mentioned at the beginning, Becky Chambers, I recently had to write an essay on one of her works, uh, the To Be Taught a Fortunate novella. Um, and one of my themes was how uh, in that novella, um, knowledge and a body of knowledge is taken sort of literally um, because the basic premise of the novella is that it's a team of scientists, of astronauts venturing out into space and rather than colonizing planets and altering planets to suit them, they are altering their bodies to be able to visit different planets. Um, and so th uh, that experience of having to alter their bodies to be able to visit different planets um, it's a very literal, like bodily form of knowledge. And that's sort of what I wrote my paper on. Um, so I like the coincidence that it's popping up here again. No, it definitely ties in so, in such an interesting way. So, thank you. This sparks for me, this return to thinking about what translation is. Um, having your mom be a colleague with your teachers, um, having some knowledge about you that they can share. So like, you know, there's an, is there such a thing as a biased or an unbiased reader? Um, I also taught for a time at my children's school and in the lunchroom, I would hear the, some of their teachers you know, saying, oh, you know, this was the 90s. So, oh, I bet their parents let those kids watch The Simpsons, which is a show in the United States that was very clever and uh, written by really great writers, but it was written on two levels. So it was a little cheeky, <laughs> but it was so interesting because I, I let my kids watch that show and they have this great cultural knowledge as a result of it. So it really helps to have, I don't know if it's an ally as much as someone who knows one at all these different interfaces of who we are. Um, and, and there's a balance for that too, because I keep thinking about my time teaching. You know, no one could really categorize what I did. I was in all grade levels, all subjects, not on one team. And it was a, an imbalance in that, oh, Lisa, you seem to know what you're doing, just go ahead. So I never had the support as a professional. There was never one integrated literacy program that would have been so much more helpful to me to be a better educator. And I think would have served my students better because I was constantly having to create stuff, which also was good. It was emergent and it was relational. So there just seems to be so many um, lenses that make us up and what we need in, in the systems, yeah. Definitely. Oh, th thank you so much for sharing that. And um, yeah, I, I completely agree that, I mean, I can only understand from what you've shared, of course, how it was in, in your experience at the time um teaching but I, I feel like also now in my own experience I see also this constant kind of need that a curriculum is different and and novel every year but then without a lot of that for instance being archived and shared with you know other institutions and us actually building these collections um mm -hmm. and talking from these lenses um yeah so and, and for me, working with students at all different levels of language and various language mm -hmm. and culture backgrounds, um, it, it didn't really matter to have a curriculum or not. I kind of got the general idea. 
but I I needed to build on what they already could uh, like come to and relate to in their own personal embodied knowledge and lived experience as a bridge. Hmm. Definitely, because I feel without it, it's still, um, it's much harder as I think the text at one point mentioned, like seeing theory almost as like this warm blanket, like where there's room for you. And I think, I'm, yeah, not a lot of people um, think of theory, unfortunately, in that way that, oh, this is a place where I might find myself as well. Um, okay. Yeah, and I agree, uh, Jonathan. You can always start from your own body. Yeah. I, and I think where the theory becomes um, mixing with the ecology or the ecosystem, like it, yeah, it's a frame. Words are good for framing, um, but mm, they're not everything. They do create worlds. We each have our own experience of what they mean to us and create our own worlds in the images. Great. I might uh, take up the, the next uh, writing, uh, reading moment. Uh, it is no accident then that the idiom body of knowledge takes the metaphor of a body, steals it, from the body in order to disembody education. But in the echoes of the idioms erasure of the body, we can still hear that somehow what we know or what we come to know is a part of bodily expression and composition. What happens when we ourselves become bodies of knowledge? Most of us do not want to talk about our bodies, at least not here in the brainy mind space, a space of academic discourse. And especially when it comes to teaching and students, part shame, part fear, part binary of the body and mind. This hesitancy can be particularly amplified for queer bodies or bodies like mine. I give off the whoever wants to read next and continue. I vote Todd. <laughs> going. Bodies do matter. A body of knowledge has everything to do with bodies. As a person whose scholarship draws most often on students and student writing, I have to contend with their bodies, or at the very least acknowledge the body. I have to raise questions over and over again about how, if, and when to represent students' bodies as part of their writing uh, or their classroom presence. I have to make decisions about what representations are ethical or necessary. I have to consider my own fears about being a queer scholar who pays attention to bodies. I'm supposed to be one of those good queers if I am to be a teacher, one who says appropriate things unerotic eunuch. I'm supposed to ignore my students' bodies. Of course, the question arises, can I really do this when so many of my courses ask students to think about gender, sexuality, and embodiment when I ask my students at times to write about themselves, their bodily expression, their bodily experiences? Take, for example, the following passage written by a student in one of my first year writing classes. 
I had asked students to spend the five days between two class meetings keeping a gender journal, one in which they were to take notice of anything they saw that they thought might be connected to gendered bodily expression. Kelsey Fagan writes, when I'm walking down the street alone, I rarely make eye contact with other people who are passing me. I never thought of this attribute as a female one, but I think maybe it might be. When I walk down the street, I tried to make eye contact with people I passed. I noticed it was much harder to make eye contact with other women than it was for me to make eye contact with men. I think if it's because I think if it's because women evaluate each other in secret, I think we look at each other's clothes and stomachs and stuff to see how we compare. With guys, who cares? Well, I'm there. Passing the baton. I'll jump in. Uh, does it help in trying to read her writing to know that Kelsey's body is a white body, a conventionally attractive, normatively gendered young woman, that she looks me in the eye, eyes all the time? Do I say I am uncomfortable saying that? Do I say she wears rings on every finger, that she closes her eyes when something is hard to think about in class, that she rolls her eyes whenever a particular classmate speaks? that she crosses her legs always when she sits and has a habit of biting her nails. I learn in Kelsey's pa passage that I am easier for her to look at, that our bodies are not in competition, that Kelsey and I are not women to each other. This is Kelsey's body of knowledge as I read it, as I am not supposed to be reading it. We know our students' bodies. We sometimes know the emotional terrain that is expressed through them. We are, by the very notion of an institutional body of knowledge, encouraged to erase this embodied knowledge, to find it irrelevant to our classroom practices. In a transpedagogical approach, processes of learning become political mechanisms through which identities can be shaped and desires mobilized, and through which the experience of bodily materiality and everyday life can take form and acquire meaning. Trans pedagogies supply a discursive mode of critique for challenging the production of social hierarchies, identities, and ideologies across the local and national boundaries. They represent both a mode of cultural production and a type of cultural criticism for questioning the conditions under which knowledge of gendered embodiment is produced. They provide a space for effective engagement for the affirmation or rejection of values and for the inhabitation, negotiation, or refusal of culturally prescribed gendered subject positions. Understanding pedagogy as a mode of cultural production in this way underscores its performative nature. It is how theory becomes practice. Pass. Thank you. I think this is like a moment where there's actually so much to unpack or at least i reading the text i don't know like for the second or third fourth time i still stumble upon this part so i'm also curious to see um how you find it hmm. i think for me the part the last part really comes in it's how theory becomes practice um and i think about um jonathan what, what you've mentioned of first going into practice, right? And not like focusing on, on theory, but is it you that mentioned that? Yeah, or like departing from, from that point first. Um, yeah, whereas here, I feel like the, the opposite is described of a, yeah. The theory is something you start to practice and, and become. And that, yeah, pedagogy as a mode of, of cultural production is is something that you know that it produces it produces people, but also produces culture. 
Um, yeah. I don't know. How, how did all of you find, find this uh, fit? It's new for me because, I mean, at least speaking from my own personal experience, I'm my my academic background really didn't. Um, I can't really recall any moment where teaching to students was enacted as a bodied experience. But for me, I felt like a lot of teaching uh, was very regimented, disembodied text categories, you know, there was a canon, you know, like the canon that we're all supposed to read. And, you know, like, I don't think even, I didn't even read my first like LGBTQ novel until senior year of high school. This was the early 2000s, might be different now. And my first book was, um, uh, it was called, uh, Oh, I forget. I had the, I had it on the tip of my tongue, but now I'm forgetting it again. But it was it was a good book, and but it's interesting because I'm from the United States, and you know a lot of a lot of there's a lot of um, you know uh, resistance against considering this this type of you know this this element of academia. You know a lot of uh, a lot of parties in, in, in this country, in, the, in my country, you know, pejoratively refer to gender studies as being something not even worth considering, you know, as if, oh, that's not going to lead you to a job where you can work and pay off your bills, you know. So I've been in that sphere. That's been like kind of the sphere I've occupied. So a lot of this is like very, it comes as really new for me. Um, I don't know if anyone else resonates, but that's just my input. Yeah, thanks so much, Todd. I think, yeah, similarly, I'm originally from Serbia, and yeah, there wasn't a kind of queer approach to teaching or a queer reference to be found in there. Um, so it only kind of went up when I started just learning on my own, kind of self-guided and stumbled upon things. But before that, there was nothing kind of in the curriculum that um, offered this way of thinking as a, as a possibility, sort of even. Yeah. The Perks of Being a Wallflower. That was the book. Perks of Being oh. a Wallflower. Loved it. It was yeah. great. <laughs> I must admit, I did too when I, when I uh, yeah, read it first. I also loved the, the film adaption as well. Oh, I didn't see it. I didn't see that. Okay. Wow. When did it come out? Mm, quite a while ago, I feel like. Um, yeah, it, was, it must have been a while ago. Yeah, more Maybe than like 20... 2010 or something, like around yeah. that. Yeah, I really gotta yeah. <laughs> go back to my history books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I can definitely relate to the um, the inevitable follow-up question of, oh, and what kind of um, job can you do with that? Um, <laughs> question from relatives and peers from different studies um even though like i mainly studied literature uh, but even there the question is prevalent but i've also minored in like gender studies um and like my master's is a bit of a mix of stuff so same idea uh i think for me my sort of first queer education was just being on tumblr in the 2010s yeah. <laughs> um same yeah, I don't think there was, I don't think there was active, positive queer education for me until uh, starting university. I, I do feel very lucky that I also haven't had negative uh, queer education, like no kind of chance or homophobia, um, like just ignorance and just n no information. Um, but yeah, it's uh, unfortunately still a privileged uh, kind of version. Yeah. Yeah, I feel that. I think it's, um, yeah, 
it's still kind of a, a tricky thing because what you mentioned of like, yeah, um, what job can you get? Or, and that being the lens through which people look, I think it's also in my own experience, both studying and um, teaching this kind of whole approach of seeing uh, education as a means to an end and to get a job as like solely practical thing of like, yeah, you are coming here so you will get employed like this is the factory that is not here to help you grow as a person understand the world better open some horizons you know but instead here you go <laughs> you're you're it's solely to put you into the capitalist machine and oh, that's you're, it you're processed yeah it's like a processing right the factory it's a degree mill <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So this is pretty much some of the grievances that are in education and, and both in teaching and in studying right now. Yeah. Lisa, I see you unmuted, but I'm not sure whether you want to say something well, or not. So I'm... Well, I'm, I'm appreciating mm, listening and um, just opening space for others. Yeah, I have been um, wondering again that perennial question I ask. You yeah. know, what's the purpose of education? And when I think of purpose, I think of um, what you know my soul uh, is. My embodied dharma and my karma is inviting me to embody. So, what is the soul journey in this lifetime um, here to? co-create with the world. Um, so part of that curriculum we're speaking to, there are lines uh, and agreements like we put children in, in rows versus some of the schools I'm in touch with now are outside. And that started because of the pandemic and then they realized, hey, this is great. Because when we're talking about fractals, we can point to that butterfly. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, this thing about what is the purpose of education? What is the purpose of education now? Um, yeah, I, I do want to honor this specific um, invitation to think about queer pedagogy, even calling, you know, just even naming something is another, an agreement. So I think of lines as agreements. Um, you know, you're on one side or another, and it and I I love thinking about you know gender as you know it's really much more of the indices between it's it's inviting folks to go into the flow and the and the middle and the depth that um, traditional industrial model education is not in service four or two. And so when someone says, um, you know, speaking, in this case, you were talking about a, a major or field of study, you know, if someone says to me, oh, I got a new job, and I say, that's going to look great on you. You know, it's like, what do you want to live in that? Who do you want to be in that? And that we have the agency for that, because it is a co-created uh, endeavor. I Thank just wanted so to much express, for that. Yeah, sorry. I'm just go. noticing no. the time's close to finishing, and I just wanted to express appreciation that was a smaller space and that we all got to talk and introduce ourselves if we wanted to talk. Because often I've been sort of jumping into sessions of like, am I connecting? Do I feel connected? And then, yeah, uh, I wasn't even sure if I was interested in what we we're going to talk about, but I appreciated getting to speak and connect. So just wanted to give the feedback that I appreciate that from this session thank you so much it really means a lot to to also yeah hear about that and to know and yeah thank you so much yeah and as you mentioned yeah we are kind of uh um running out of time um yeah so there is still i mean i can also share um maybe the the fuller 
uh, like the full PDF in this drive, because you, if you save the link, you'll probably still have it afterwards. Um, if anyone is still interested in, um, yeah, the, the full uh, book. Uh, and yeah, I just wanted to thank you all so much for, for being here and for sharing and for bringing your own um, energies and experiences. And yeah, that's always, for me at least, what um, makes this reading cl club special, kind of like the, the aspect of sharing with everyone. Um, yeah, and creating a space together. So thank you so much for that. And... Thank you.